Okay, let's keep things rolling by introducing our first speaker. Salim Ishmael is a lot of things. He's a best-selling author of the book Exponential Organizations. He's also a renowned technology strategist, an entrepreneur who sold his eighth company, Engstro, to Google in 2010, and who also ran Yahoo's Brickhouse Incubator for several years. He was the founding executive director and global ambassador at Singularity University since 2008. Salim advises global CEOs and heads of state on exponential organizations, innovations, and growth, and believes that if you're not disrupting your business or industry, somebody else is. So here to talk about how security and cloud teams can get out of their own way to disrupt and innovate by taking advantage of accelerating technologies like artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and big data analytics, please join me in welcoming Salim Ishmael. Thank you, thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to give you a sense of how pervasive this transformation that is that we're going through. Uh, but more importantly, what can you do about it? Uh, the, the, we're entering a world in which technology is driving us very, very quickly forward in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, I wrote this book a few years ago highlighting how this actually operates and how new organizations are leveraging new technologies like the cloud to scale in ways that we've never seen before. But basically, we're moving the entire world uh, to the cloud, right? And this is causing some extraordinary tensions in all of our organizations. Uh, we're turning brands into experiences, we're turning products into services. Really the big question is how do you organize for this future that's coming? Uh, one of the key insights that came a few years ago was from this graph that Ray Kurzweil put together. He was looking at Moore's Law and he went all the way back to 1900 and found that we've actually been doubling computational price performance for 100 years way before Gordon Moore made his predictions. And the key question that he asked when he saw this data is why is that curve so smooth and so predictable? We've had wars and recessions and ups and downs in the industry. You should expect a very jagged stock market type of shape, not this very, very steady progression that we see here. And after researching this for like 10 years, uh, Ray came up with a really fundamental observation which is once you turn any domain or discipline or technology area into an information-driven environment and virtualize it, uh, you enter a doubling pattern. And most importantly, once that doubling pattern starts, it does not stop. And that's very hard for us to get our heads around. Uh, we've seen several technologies now go through kind of an S-curve type of a shape, but something else always takes over the curve when you have this virtualized environment, this cloud environment. And this is a fundamental insight that we're seeing. Uh, it led Peter Diamandis, our other main founder at Singularity University, to write this book called Abundance, charting out that if we can actually harness this pace of change and this acceleration effectively, that we'll soon have an abundance of healthcare, clean water, energy, education in about a decade. And what does the world look like if that's the case? So that's kind of a, one key framing that we found. That doubling pattern that we've seen in computation that we've lived through with all of our devices, we're now seeing that in about a dozen technologies. Drones, 3D printing, neuroscience, AI, uh, robotics, uh, Bitcoin. We have now dozens, about a dozen technologies all doubling in this way. And we have never seen this before. It's a completely unique time in the history of mankind. In the past, maybe one technology was accelerating or another was, but now we have a full dozen. Right? And each of them is accelerating, but where they intersect, that adds a whole other multiplier to the equation. And the aggregate effect is quite profound. Here's a 700-year look at the cost of light. And what you can see here is it's very, very expensive, then it plateaus for a while, and then it crashes to near zero as we industrialize the heck out of it. What's really important here is the shape of this curve, because here's another look at the cost of DNA sequencing, and you see a very, very similar shape. Very expensive, plateaus for a while, crashes to near zero. And here we have the look at the cost of solar modules, and here again you see exactly the same shape. And in technology after technology after technology, the cost is crashing, meaning that we have all sorts of opportunities, meaning that that's creating a forcing function, meaning it's that much harder to manage it, make sense of it all, and so on. And this is happening across all of these domains that we can see. And this is causing some fascinating uh, effects. Our, our brains have a tough time with this. Our brains cognitively are all geared to kind of make linear, incremental, predictive kind of estimations. We're very bad cognitively at understanding this exponential growth. 
and our and this is causing a lot of stress. And I'll give you a couple of examples a bit later about how that's how dramatically that's happening. When we apply that to industries, uh, we've seen kind of this transformation happen, where the vast majority of our history is the sheer physicality of the world. All the business models, value creation, revenue came from the sheer extracting resources, assembling raw material, <laughs> moving things around. But little by little, we're shifting that around. And now we're seeing completely digitally driven information environments, cloud environments, and so on. And all the value creation comes from moving things, virtualizing things, managing things, things in the cloud. Um, I write in the book that the Tesla is not really a car with computers and sensors in it. It's really a computer with wheels. Right? And you think of it very differently when you look at it from that that, when that perspective. Um, actually, one of our alumni corrected me on that, said you're wrong about that. Remember that it updates itself every few weeks. So you have to think of it as an app that has wheels. And that really kind of breaks your brain. But you can see the directionality of that is totally correct. Right? And we're heading that way. Uh, the updates that we have in that car are quite profound. And I'll give you an example of that. So as a result of kind of technology, a bunch of technologies moving this quickly, we see four major dynamics happening. The first is very obvious. We're digitizing the world very quickly. Right? Our memories aren't in our heads anymore. They're on our smartphones. All our relationships are now digital because of social media as opposed to analog. About 10 years ago, we had maybe half a billion internet-connected devices out in the world. We're up today to about 15 uh, billion. Ericsson made this prediction that we'd be at 50 billion by the end of the decade. But because this is doubling every year or so, pretty quickly after that, we're going to get to a trillion. Okay? Think of that one statistic, 15 billion today going to a trillion in the next few years. We think we're 30, 40 years into the information revolution. On this statistic, we're at 1.5%. We're just starting. Right? So most of this disruption is ahead of us as opposed to behind us. And we can see the speed with which we're digitizing all sorts of domains around us. Uh, one of my favorite examples is this one. This team out of Israel can take a 10-second clip of your voice. And just by analyzing the variation in the tone, they can assess your mood and your attitude to about an 85% accuracy. Um, on like 400 different categories. Customer service teams are using this today. If, if an angry customer calls, what's the underlying attitude? You know, can you, can you save the account or do you just hang up the phone and move on because you, you've lost them anyway, right? Um, you can actually download this app called Moody's if you want to try this out. Uh, try this out on your spouse if you want to have an interesting discussion about their mood. <laughs> that one, of course, doesn't go very well. Um, but it starts to get very surreal. I was speaking at one of our conferences recently. And while I was on stage, one of our alumni taped 13 seconds of my voice and showed the results to the audience. So that was my mood and my attitude as I was speaking on stage, which gets totally kind of unnerving. Of course, totally wrong about the stubbornness. I disagree fundamentally with that. And you see how kind of weird that gets. We actually did an event a year ago during the presidential debates. So while Trump and Clinton were speaking and debating, we had a ticker saying, here's what they're really thinking, which I won't kind of reveal here for, for political correctness. Uh, now, we found that when you digitize something, it becomes highly, highly disruptive. And the, the scale of this is hard to imagine. I'll just pick one example. Take solar energy. Uh, energy has been scarce for the entire history of humanity, and it's about to become abundant. Uh, we're seeing the cost of solar price crash dramatically. In about 14 years, we will be able to deliver enough energy with solar to power the entire planet in 14 years, because that doubling pattern keeps going. Right? And so this is going to cause a complete uh, change in geopolitics globally. The Middle East has enormous issues. The Athabasco oil sands in Canada, I'm Canadian, have been yelling at the Canadian government. They will never be used uh, because of this dynamic and so on. And we're seeing sort of quite chaotic effects as a result of it. The country of Chile today is already generating so much solar, they're giving it to their neighbors for free. Okay, that's happening today. Uh, in California, a quarter of the farms are already solar powered. And maybe in the ultimate of all ironies, the coal museum in Kentucky is now using solar panels to power themselves, right? And how do they look in the mirror? Because like this, the, and you can see this kind of pattern now emerging in all of these technologies and all of these industries. And we're seeing quite extraordinary disruption. Uh, I actually tried to live this myself. Uh, 18 months ago, I took a Tesla and I drove from Miami all the way up to Toronto. I'd stopped at the charging stations uh, every kind of 100 miles or so. Uh, I, the car drove itself for a big chunk of the time. And because the charging stations were free, the entire trip cost me zero. That was a Gutenberg moment. In the, in the 1500s, the printing press changed everything. This will change everything. More interestingly, uh, uh, a month ago, I came back. Uh, and I want to show you the data here. Um, 
Look at that statistic at the bottom there. When I drove up 18 months ago, uh, the car drove itself about 35% of the time. When I drove back, same car, same sensors, the car drove itself about 80% of the time. Just in the change of the data, the ability to manage uh, data in the cloud, the ability to leverage algorithms and know how much better the car is moving, that many more cars going down the same highway. Fascinating to see that trip. Right? Um, I will never, I mean, when we came back to Miami a few weeks ago, I said to my wife, you, you fly, I'll take the car. Uh, I made about 80 conference calls along the way. It was a complete paradigm shift. And this is what's happening today. Today we have about 20 such Gutenberg moments all hitting us at the same time. And our ability to manage this is going to be incredibly difficult and stressful as a result of that. Because the technologies are all very sexy. I could kind of go on for a long time about that. But we have a really fundamental issue at a very pervasive level, which is that we are not ready as a society to absorb this pace of change. In fact, I'll argue that every mechanism that we use to run the world, our civics, our politics, our legal systems, our healthcare systems, intellectual property, education, computation, et cetera, all designed for a world a few hundred years ago, not for today. And definitely not for the trillion sensors that are coming. We actually need to re-architect it pretty much from the ground up. Let me give you two examples. Um, an obvious one is education. We designed our education systems uh, pretty much globally to take a young child, train them through their early 20s with specific skills to be ready for the existing job market. Right? Except small problem. We don't know what a job looks like in five years. What are we teaching them? Right? And so that's starting. Yet if you try and update education, you have what I call the immune system response. The teachers unions will attack you. The textbook publishers will attack you. The regulators will attack you. And we see this pervasively in every mechanism. You try and update a legacy environment with disruptive new ideas, and you'll get this immune system fight back. The taxis fighting Uber. And we see this on all of our departments. If you try and update how you did things the way for, to match what's happening in the world today, the legacy thinking will come and attack you. And I saw this at Yahoo when I was running their incubator in very sharp relief. Uh, I was set up in a separate office. We were looking at the empty office space uh, with my developers. And a truck rolls up with furniture, uh, with full of cubicles in Dilbert hell. And the guy says, I'm from facilities. I'm here to deliver the furniture. And we're like, no, 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 we don't want this, because we, we want like bean, ba bean bags and ping pong tables. And he's like, no, no, my bonus depends on me delivering the furniture. I'm coming in. Right? And I'm like, well, how do I get rid of it? And he goes, not my problem. Right? And I spent like the afternoon on the phone calling his boss and his boss's boss and my boss and my boss. Finally, I'm able to get rid of the guy. Right? And I'm finally at peace because my developers are not going to be there if, if I have kind of standard furniture the way we've done it before. Two weeks later, same truck, same furniture arrives, uh, same driver. And I said, what happened? I thought we dealt with this. And he goes, my manager changed. Notice you didn't have the furniture. I have a direct order to come in and deliver the furniture. And, and all my deliver developers walked out of the office. It was like, we, we didn't come here for this. Uh, but yellow and purple color couches, the hell with that. And so he's not being a bad guy, right? He's just doing what the in, he's incented to do because all of our organizations are designed for efficiency and for predictability. They are not designed for agility, flexibility, adaptability, and yet that is the driving force today. And this applies pervasively to all of our institutions. Take something on a slightly lighter note, like marriage. We invented marriage about eight, 9,000 years ago. And mar when marriage first surfaced as an institution, average lifespan was about 25 years old. So you got married, you had kids, and you died. Marriage is not designed to last 50, 60 years. That's, that's, that's state-sanctioned torture, basically, is what it is, right? And so how do you update that institution? We get really stressed out about the divorce rate and so on. It is not designed for what we're putting it through today. And this applies, as I said, pervasively across the board. So we need a very deep mindset shift. And this forcing function of technology is a driver that cannot be ignored. Kevin Kelly wrote this book called What Technology Wants, showing that you cannot slow it down. It's moving at its own pace. If you try and uh, stop it in one area, it goes to another area. And our heads are very, are, it's very hard to get our heads around this. When the Google car came out eight, nine years ago, the cost of the LiDAR, GPS sensors, radar added up to about $200,000 a car. And all the car companies looked at that and said, ah, cute research project, and they ignored it. Two years later, it was $100,000 a car. Two years later, $50,000 a car. Even then, the response was, who's going to pay $50,000 for all those sensors? We're down below $1,000 a car today for all the sensors, and everybody's freaking out now. Right? The cost of this LiDAR unit at the top of this Prius cost $75,000 five years ago, and you can get that today for $50.
Why? Because you have several accelerating technologies all combining, and the aggregate effect is a huge multiplier. And of course, the next version will be $10, and it will disappear, dematerialize completely into our smartphones. Um, and this is really driven by the sheer democratization. Today, anybody can pick up, a, uh, enter a legacy industry with a new technology and totally disrupt it. Uh, Elon Musk's Hyperloop idea is an example. It used to be that disruptive innovation only came from a big corporate lab or a government lab. And now today, anybody can do this. Elon is about to launch his big satellite and his rockets today. And his MO, by the way, is really simple. He looks at the technologies that's accelerating, like neural technology or battery technology, aims 10 years out. Where will it be in 10 years? And builds a company to intercept that curve. Right? And that works pretty well for him. Uh, and because of this, now this is a, everybody can get into this and it's hard to adapt. So the question is, what do you do? How do you adapt your world to this, to this new pace of change? This quote by David Rose has been stuck in my head for quite a few years, and it was one of the reasons I wrote the book. Our organizations are designed for 20th century thinking, not for where the world is today. And so we need to update that. And most importantly, we need to figure out how to update the immune system in our existing environments, our legacy thinking. Um, and maybe the strangest phone call I've received in the few years that I've been thinking about this is from the Vatican. Uh, the Pope has the oldest immune system in the world, right? As he tries to update that, that institution, he has some interesting challenges on his hands. What we found in our model is that if you implement four out of 10 attributes, you actually get a 10x multiplier in your organizational effectiveness. And so we've kind of crafted that model. But most importantly, the work that we've been doing recently is we've figured out a 10-week process that solves that immune system problem. We take out uh, the senior management of a company, we get them together, we do a session that freaks them out to show them how disruptively the world is changing. And then we take the young leaders, future lieutenants of that business, they do a set of work uh, to say, how would you build, a, a grow this business 10x within a few years? And then we help launch those. And we've, we piloted this two years ago with Procter & Gamble. We've now done it about a dozen times. And we found a 10-week process that moves the culture, leadership, management thinking three years ahead in that 10-week period. So we're pretty excited about this. We're actually writing a book on this to open source the process so that anybody can do it, self-provision it, and run it. Because my current thesis is every one of the global 5,000 has to go through this process with or without us. Right? And it's really important to do this. We've also applied this to cities where we take a city and we take them through a similar process, and we found we can solve a problem facing a city for about one-tenth of the current cost. We've run it four times in Medellin, and we just finished with the mayor of Miami on the future of transportation, and we're open sourcing that as well. So we now have, for the first time ever, a structured way in which to move our <coughs> culture, leadership, management thinking very quickly forward, rather than waiting for a long time. Because today, technology is a massive forcing function. A dozen technologies all accelerating gives us a, a, a pressure that we've never seen before, and we desperately need to adapt our old ways of thinking. And in the cloud world or the security world, the patterns and the mechanism that we've been using for 20, 30 years don't apply with the threat vector that's appearing today. So we really need to do this, especially in that world, because as we kind of expose ourselves with that explosion of data, we absolutely need to update how we think about the world in that way. So really looking forward to this, uh, this panel. Thank you for having me. And Renee, thanks for having me again here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Thank you very much.